So it's uh, my pleasure to uh, open this second session of uh, this conference and to uh, introduce uh, our keynote speaker, so Melanie Jones uh, from uh, Cardiff Business School, where she is professor of uh, economics. Uh, so she has been working in the area of labor economics uh, and mostly, uh, as you can imagine, uh, in quantitative analysis of large-scale surveys such as uh, the LFS. She has worked in particularly on uh, labor market, labor market sorry, inequalities uh, in the UK. She has uh, also collaborated with various organizations such as the Low Pay Commission, the Office for Manpower Economics, and she's one of the uh, ONS fellows. She also edits, uh, she's an editor at the British Journal of uh, Industrial Relations and a member of the Council uh, of the Royal Economic Society. She also assesses uh, the SSC grant, she's part of Panel C, and uh, the review body on doctors and dentist remuneration. So, uh, Melanie, uh, the floor is yours, and uh, we are really interested in uh, your presentation on disability and the UK labor market. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction, and obviously thank you for the invitation um, to be here today. I have used LFS data right since my PhD, which is a, a long time ago now. I continue to use it, and I hope to continue to use it in the future, um, in whatever form it, it takes. So I'm going to talk through today, um, not one paper, not one academic paper, but actually a series of academic papers that I hope will join together and kind of give an insight into both the experience of disability in the UK labour market, but also the different type of things you can do with LFS stroke APS data. And actually, I'll try and highlight a couple of things that I don't think you can do, and actually, you could get complementary data to look at some of those issues. I hope it won't feel like a real superficial rush through a lot of papers. If it does, um, apologies in advance, and please do come and talk to me about those papers that you are interested in. So when I talk about disability, what do I mean? I am a labour economist with an interest in inequality. Um, so I'm interested in disabilities and inequality characteristic, a protected characteristic under UK legislation. In terms of the concept, I'm generally talking about a long-term health problem which is limiting in some way. The definition of that does vary. There are typically two that we see used in the academic literature. One is work limiting, so restrictions on the nature or the type of work you can do. The other is activity lim limiting, which is around day-to-day -day activities. That measure is what's aligned to equality legislation. The LFS um, has both measures. I've used both. Um, but I think there's been a movement towards um, aligning the analysis of disability towards that activity limiting definition. In terms of how it's actually measured, so it's changed over time, as you'd expect. Um, enhancements in, in surveys, also changes in legislation has meant the definition's changed over time. But the current definition has been consistent since 2013. Activity limiting um, disability is defined as first stage, do you have a long-term health problem, which is uh, a restriction, um, a health problem that lasts 12 months or more. Then is it restricting, so it's restricting in your day-to-day -day activities, for which those individuals can answer yes a little, yes a lot, or no, not at all. So if you answer yes to the first one, and yes in either forms to the second one, you would be disabled according to the activity limiting uh, definition, if you answer no to the first question, or yes and then no, you would be non-disabled. I'm going to use that definition for most of what I'm going to talk about um, today. Some of it will be work limiting, but I'm always going to really focus on what I think of as a global binary measure of um, disability. As I think has already been touched upon by one of the questions, there are m many more detailed questions in the LFS allow you to go in to uh, the nature of uh, the impairment, um, how many health conditions you have, and I'll briefly touch upon that, but most of um, the work I'll present is on, on that binary measure. 
In terms of what I've learned, so I've learned that, um, like most data, when you start utilising data, it becomes far more complicated than you thought at the start. Not least, disability is, is self-reported, so it's subjective, and even an individual with the same kind of um, health condition in the same kind of environment might report disability differently. That gives rise to your kind of classical measurement error, whereby um, we'd expect there to be a downward bias on our kind of estimates of labour market implications. But at the same time, we've got arguments that actually particular groups of individuals might use disability to somehow justify their economic status. So let's say as an explanation for not working. If you have that kind of bias, then you have a situation whereby you're going to overestimate the impact of disability on labour market outcomes. There's a big debate in the literature about which one, um, if either, um, dominate the other. We typically use this self-reported measure, but kind of recognise that these challenges are there and that in some situations they're going to be larger rather than smaller. The other thing that I think I'm very aware of, um, particularly in the discussion that we've had this morning, is around disability is really sensitive to the way you ask the questions and actually more generally the survey. So even really small changes in the questions can produce large um, changes in estimates of prevalence. And I remember not that long ago there was just a change to the introduction of the question block in, in terms of a wording um, and it caused a change in prevalence of disability. So you have to be really careful comparing disability rates across surveys and you have to be very, very aware of discontinuities in data collection relating to disability. I hope you can just about see that, but this is disability prevalence. So this is the proportion of the working age population that would be classified as activity limiting disability and it plots uh, a series over time from 2013. The first thing that I think always shocks people is the extent of prevalence. So there's a relatively high rate of prevalence, I think, relative to people's expectations. You get here, let's say in 2013, about 16 or so percent of the working age population. But what you can see quite clearly um, over time is that there's been this growth in disability prevalence amongst the UK um, working age population. It's important to say that that's happened before um, COVID-19, so there's been a lot of attention on disability post-COVID-19, but this trend um, was certainly evident before. And if you look at the most recent estimates, you'd see about a quarter of the population would be um, classified as disabled. In terms of labour market outcomes, the kind of headline measure of labour market inequality in relation to disability tends to be the disability employment gap. It's certainly where the focus of government attention has been, that's just a measure of the difference in the employment rates between disabled and non-disabled individuals. So you'll see that at about 30 percentage points because the employment rate amongst disabled people will be much closer to 50%, much closer to 80% amongst non-disabled individuals. It's large relative to other protected characteristics and it's been a persistent problem. So despite government um, attention and a range of kind of interventions, particularly on the supply side, welfare to work, what we've seen is a relative persistence in the disability employment gap. It has narrowed over time and that's partly, I think, why we haven't seen the attention on that rising disability prevalence at the start of the period. So even though disability was rising in terms of prevalence, because the disability employment gap was falling. To some extent, those two things were netting out. If you look at the COVID period, you'll see a stagnation in that fall in the disability employment gap. So a fall in the disability employment gap would be essentially a relative improvement in disabled people's employment rates. We get this stagnation um, post-COVID-19, and as a result of that, we have a greater proportion of the population with the same, essentially, employment disadvantage. The easiest way, I think, to put those two things together and realise why disability is increased amongst the policy agenda is if you multiply those two things together, you can think of it as a kind of measure of total employment loss due to disability in the um, economy. And what you'll see is then that post uh, the pandemic, we've had this rise in prevalence at the same time where we're not seeing any improvement in terms of labour market outcomes. 
That's the period where we've seen a tension on inactivity due to long-term sickness, due to restrictions on the supply side, the potential kind of impact of long-term health problems on economic growth. So I hope that sets the kind of scene in terms of what I've done. So the first thing I think I did as a PhD student was to look at how can I use the labour force survey to better understand that disability employment gap. So whilst we often produce statistics in one dimension, a bit like I've done now, actually the strength of the LFS is that it contains a comprehensive um, set of information about the individual. So you can pick up things, for example, their age, individuals' educational attainment, where they live and so on, and we would, in a regression type framework, control for those things. So even on the basis of descriptive statistics, we know that disabled people are on average older, they're less well qualified. Those things will affect their employment rate, and so we want to net out those effects. And that's essentially um, a decomposition analysis where we try and say, okay, if we adjust for those things, is there still an influence of disability? And there is, and in general, a relatively small part of that disability employment gap is explained. I did some work quite a while ago now where it said about 25% was explained. So a large unexplained gap. What is more difficult then is to try and say, well, what, what is determining that gap? It's something to do with disability that we don't observe in the data. But that can be preferences, that can be gaps in terms of um, productivity effects. There are a whole range of influences that may drive people to take different um, work choices. A particular um, kind of focus of the literature has been around trying to identify discrimination. So is it essentially barriers, um, the role of employers in terms of uh, reducing employment opportunities for disabled individuals? And I think we've done a lot in terms of trying to enhance that specification to try and explore to what extent the unexplained gap can be attributed to other things. But I think in surveys like the Labour Force Survey, we are going to be limited. And so a more direct measure um, of discrimination comes through our own sort of data collection with field experiments. So that's what we've more, more recently done, is essentially we've done a correspondence study where we've actually collected our own data by manipulating CVs. So sending out um, CVs, otherwise equivalent, but in some you signal disability and in others not. And you look at essentially the callback rate or the invitation to interview um, for disabled versus non-disabled individuals. We did that and it's been done internationally. Internationally there's fairly consistent evidence of hiring discrimination against disabled individuals. Our study was um, fairly recent and so our measure of hiring discrimination is generally lower than the international literature and we find it in one specific occupation. So we argue that the kind of very tight labour market post-COVID-19 might be reducing discrimination against disabled individuals and that in our um, analysis we find it's not uh, evident for accountants, certified accountants, but it is for the less skilled role of financial accounts assistants. So interesting questions then about the extent to which um, it applies to other um, occupations. Even though I think most of the attention has been on employment in terms of disability, I think one of the things I've tried to do um, is highlight the fact that employment isn't sort of the end of labour market inequality in relation to disability. And actually, if you look at in-work outcomes, you'll typically also see gaps in relation to disability. The first one is hours. So the disability employment gap actually underestimates kind of labour supply type differences because there's also a gap in hours in work, conditional on work. There are gaps in other job characteristics, so self-employment versus um, employee status is another one. Disabled individuals more like to be self-employed. But the one that I just want to spend more time on here is the disability pay gap, not least because pay gaps tend to get more attention around other equality characteristics. 
In terms of the disability pay gap, its size, about 10 to 15 percent, is very comparable with other protected characteristics like gender. It gets nowhere near the same degree of attention, and unlike gender, it has been highly persistent, so it's not showing signs of diminishing. Again, I've been interested in trying to work out to what extent other characteristics of disabled individuals might drive that, both in terms of their personal but also job-related characteristics. So can we say that disabled individuals are getting paid less for sort of comparable work? Again, if you do that sort of exercise, you'll find that part of it is due to other characteristics, but only about half. So about half of the raw disability pay gap is unexplained, potentially, again, due to discrimination, although, again, it's very difficult, I think, in the context of disability to ac accurately attribute that um, unexplained gap. More recently, then, what I've done is look beyond the mean. So um, most of the literature has been very focused on sort of the disability pay gap at the mean. And I've looked across the wage distribution looking at disability pay gaps amongst very low earners, very high earners, to try and um, identify what we tend to call glass ceilings, so big gaps at the top end of the wage distribution amongst high earners or sticky floors, bigger gaps down the bottom. And hopefully this figure will try and summarise um, the evidence that I found. This is based on pooled LFS data, so I think it's from about 2013 to 2020. And it also has a, a sectoral split. So you'll see that I've broken the private sector, which is in the black, from the public sector, which is in the grey. You can see, first of all, that the disability pay gap varies across the wage distribution. It increases across the wage distribution, particularly so in the private sector. So you see a much um, steeper gradient in the private sector. The two dashed lines are the unexplained gap. So you can see in both cases, both for the private sector and the public sector, the unexplained gap lies within the disability pay gap. So part of that raw disability pay gap is explained by other things. But nevertheless, we get a similar pattern that the private sector is above the public sector and that, particularly in the private sector, we see this rise over the distribution. What does that mean? Well, we think it means that kind of the organisation or the institution potentially matters for the disability pay gap. Um, there's clearly more work to do to look at what, what it is about the public sector that might be offer some relative protection in terms of pay, but also that the mean can hide um, quite a lot of variation and that actually things like progression <coughs> um, amongst disabled people might be a potential way of further exploring why the disability pay gap is higher at the top end of the distribution. Okay, so what else have I used um, LFS data? I think employment gaps, pay gaps are probably the standard thing that you would expect someone to use the LFS for. I've also looked at not just trends over time, but kind of um, shocks to the labour market. So this is an example where I looked at the impact of COVID-19. It was very early um, when I did this, so we had sort of one year of data post um, the pandemic. So I focus very much not just on sort of the immediate impact, but also what we called risk factors, which were the characteristics of really employment um, of disabled people relative to non-disabled people in the year prior to um, COVID-19. It's quite an interesting exercise, and why I've mentioned it today is because in many cases, you couldn't just use the standard indicators like employment and pay in exactly the same way because, uh, and when we did look at employment and pay, we didn't see um, an impact. But what happened was you had sort of government support in the form of furlough, which meant people were still employed, but might well be temporarily away from work. So you had to use the LFS in a kind of way to proxy these um, measures. So it has information from, on working from home, it has information on te temporarily being away from work, which I use as a proxy for, for furlough. It also has detailed information on occupation and industry that allowed me to define things like shutdown industries, if you remember those more prone to being affected. Um, key workers, so by occupation, you could look at some of the um, occupational groups that were expected to work and be in high demand during the pandemic. 
And the other thing that I did was use those occupational industry codes to map in external information, which I think, again, is another way to think of use, utilising the LFS. So things like um, exposure to disease and also um, ability to work from home within the occupation, you can map in at an occupational level. In terms of the results, of, for the first bit of analysis, we're dealing with pre um, COVID-19, and I'm just looking at the characteristics that you might think of as might predict exposure to both health and economic shocks. Essentially, it's a regression model where um, column one has no controls, column two has a set of personal characteristics. You'll see that doesn't actually make a huge amount of difference in most cases. What um, I focus on is, is the role of disability indicator. You can see there that disabled people were more likely to be working in shutdown industries, they weren't more likely to work as key workers. They were more likely to be working in proximity to others, so at health risk, and similarly, therefore, the measure of exposure to disease is higher. In the final panel, um, they were more likely to work from home prior to the pandemic. The ability to work from home um, is an indicator which actually goes in the opposite direction. So. That positive coefficient there is actually an indicator of inability to work from home. It's not very helpful the way that it's presented. So disabled people were more likely to work from home pre-pandemic, but they were actually working in the occupations where it was less likely to have um, working from home. The second table, I've stripped away some of the panels that were in the paper to focus on where there is an impact. So what I should say is there was no impact in the first year on employment. Um, the disability employment gap, and there was no impact on the disability pay gap. So I've picked out here areas where there was an impact, and here we're not interested in the disability coefficient. We're looking at did the impact of COVID-19 vary by disability? So it's the interaction effect we're really interested in, which is the third coefficient there. So the top panel is temporarily away from work, my proxy for furlough. The second panel is working from home. And um, the specifications just get more comprehensive. They control for personal characteristics, work-related characteristics, and occupation and industry, finally. You see that the results aren't particularly sensitive to that. The, the patterns are common. So what does it say? It says that even prior to COVID-19, disabled people were more likely to be temporarily away. COVID-19 increased amongst um, the non-disabled group. Um, the probability of being temporarily away from work, but it disproportionately impacted on disabled people. So you've got there a coefficient of about 0.04, which is, is about 40% larger than the non-disabled individuals. The reasons for that, again, are complicated. It could be around decisions by individuals as well as their firms to um, be on furlough, but what it certainly suggests is that disabled people were disproportionately having um, time away from the labour market and therefore may have um, problems re-engaging or um, loss of human capital during that time. In terms of working from home, um, disabled people confirming what we saw last time were more likely, slightly more likely to work from home than non-disabled individuals. Post-COVID-19, there was an increase in working from home, and I should say that the measure of working from home here, as you can see, the kind of metric or the increase due to COVID-19 is perhaps underestimated. I think it's a question about mainly working from home, and in the first year, I think people weren't very sure about how to interpret that, and some other surveys show a much bigger jump in terms of working from home. But what we get is a negative sign on the interaction so that disabled people were not benefiting as much as non-disabled individuals in terms of that rise for working from home, which is very consistent with them being in roles which, where it wasn't easy to work from home. I wanted to make sure that I did touch upon the kind of longitudinal properties of the LFS. I think they're generally underutilised, um, not least because obviously people associated with a very short panel of one year and I've used that sort of data for job retention. But the one thing I did some time ago was um, a project that used the annual population survey. 
And in the annual population survey, you have the main LFS, but you also have observations from the local labour force survey, and that local labour force survey has a different panel structure. So within that, we created a panel of potentially a maximum of four years for individuals by linking individuals across the, um, annu the four annual population surveys. The first thing to say, particularly given my ONS colleagues who are in the room, that it's not, it's not designed as a panel. It's not designed to be used as that. It's not nationally representative. So I wouldn't think of this as a source of national statistics, but I think it is an underutilised resource in terms of having a large sample for a relatively short panel. In terms of what we did with it, I looked, first of all, at the dynamics of disability. So we were looking at essentially patterns of disability onset and exit and really confirming what we'd seen in the shorter panel, we see disability is highly dynamic. Then we have the opportunity, if you know that disability is dynamic, to look at the impact of onset and exit of disability and to use panel data methods to get closer to what we might think of as causal relationships. So looking at selection effects into disability, the actual impact at onset and then duration effects post um, onset. So in terms of the dynamic patterns, so this is a, um, a minimum of three consecutive observations and then we classify individuals in terms of the dynamics. What you can see is there are about 75% of the sample um, were continuously not disabled, so never disabled when we observed them. Contrast that, 10% were continuously disabled when we observed them. The others had dynamic patterns of disability. So a lot more people had some experience of disability but weren't permanently. In terms of that, there is roughly equal representation of onset. So by consistent onset, I mean you go from non-disabled to disabled and then you remain um, disabled. Exit, <coughs> exit is the opposite way and then irregular would be some kind of mixed pattern. So we focused on those... Um, with onset and exit, and we model their labour market transitions, essentially. That gets really small, I think, on your screen, but essentially what I'm doing now is modelling employment in the first column, hours in the second column, and we look at, essentially, utilising a fixed effects model, so we take into account now unobserved heterogeneity of the individual, and we look how the labour market disadvantage accumulates over time. In both cases, we look from uh, what is T minus three, so essentially onset minus three years, and we look at how things change. In that first uh, red box, you can see that at onset, T star, onset one year later, onset two years later, you get a negative coefficient. So essentially what it's saying is your employment probability declines. It declines um, at onset, but not before disability onset. So it seems to be that it's the disability leading to employment loss and the magnitude of that effect gets bigger. So it accumulates over time consistent with the duration effect. It doesn't really matter whether you use employment probabilities or hours. It's a similar um, magnitude of the effect. And actually when we looked at hours conditional on work or pay conditional on work, we didn't see such effect. So it's very much at the employment margin. If you look at the second panel, which are the exits, so these are people that go from being disabled to non-disabled, you get much smaller effects in terms of re-engagement with the labour market, consistent with what we talk about in the paper, that asymmetry of the impact of disability. So onset has a big um, decline in terms of your employment probabilities. Exit has some association with re-engagement or an increase in employment but the much larger effects are at onset, and so in terms of sort of policy um, recommendations, it would be job retention at disability onset that you'd expect to get the biggest gains. I said I wouldn't really talk about this. I don't have time to present the results by heterogeneity, but in most of that analysis, um, I do some analysis of heterogeneity, both by the nature of disability, but also by other characteristics. So the LFS is rich enough to give us information on the nature of disability. Typically, that enables me to distinguish between physical and mental health problems at, at a minimum. If you do that work, you tend to find that mental health problems have more severe labour market disadvantage. 
Similarly, you can do some work on severity using both the number of health problems in individual reports, but also whether they report it affects them a little or a lot. Again, as you'd expect, labour market disadvantage tends to be greater for those with more severe um, health problems. But there's also interesting work um, to do in relation to the interaction between disability and other uh, personal characteristics. So it tends to be um, the impact of disability is worse if you've got relatively low education levels. It's also worse if you're in an area which is relatively deprived. So there's um, opportunities to combine things to learn more about the impact of disability. Before I finish, I did want to say something about what um, the LFS can't tell us or can tell us less about. In the LFS, we have some characteristics of the employer. We have things like uh, industry, we have uh, workplace size, but we don't really know much about what goes on in the firm, the kind of management practices. So I have used quite regularly data from WERS, the Workplace Employment Relations Survey, which obviously is now um, fairly old, but where you can link employee data on disability to understand sort of disability pay gaps in different types of organisations where you have different workplace policies and practices. And we certainly found that the disability pay gap varies depending on, for example, whether your um, employer has uh, an equal opportunities policy that mentions disability. So there is a role there for the employer. Most recently now we've got the opportunity to link disability from census data to the ASH, the annual survey of hours and earnings, payroll data to again get an insight of not just is the disability pay gap measured on self-reported pay, is it, is it a good indicator if we look at um, payroll data, but also how it varies within firm versus people working across different types of firms. And similarly, I think the, um, some other data sets have richer measures of sort of job quality or, or well-being at work, and I've certainly used data relating to job satisfaction, people's perceptions of their management, their sense of loyalty to the organisation, and consistent with what you've seen there, um, the disability gaps in all those indicators, which are important, um, not just in their own right, but also because we know that those kind of measures are important in terms of quits or um, other measures that may determine the uh, disability employment gap. The other thing that I wanted to show you in terms of shocks to the labour market is again a figure from WERS. So WERS um, allows you to get more detailed information on things like how work is organised, workload amongst the um, employee, and they asked a series of questions relating to uh, the 2008 uh, recession, how you've been affected by it. And here they are, self-reported information uh, split by disabled and non-disabled employees. The ones in bold are s statistically significant gaps, and again, you see a consistent pattern of non-disabled individuals being less likely to report being affected. That holds true if you do the multivariate analysis and you look at um, accounting for job characteristics. So even disabled and non-disabled individuals in similar jobs um, report a different experience of the recession and a more negative experience of the recession for disabled employees. So to conclude, um, the Labour Force Survey has um, provided for some time a key source of information on disability. It's allowed me and many others to explore trends in that over time and to explore the determinants of them because of the richness of the data. What it shows is a significant disability related labour market disadvantage, even after conditioning on other personal and job related characteristics. It extends beyond employment to in work outcomes. Pretty much all the in work outcomes we've explored, um, disability also has an influence. It allows a huge range of opportunities to explore heterogeneity, not just in terms of the disability itself, but also across um, sectors. I've done some work looking at the role of unions. Does um, being a union member affect um, disability pay gaps and so on? You can get additional insights from the longitudinal analysis. So you can look at the longitudinal LFS to look at things like uh, annual transitions, 
um, disability dynamics, and you can look at um, how those two things interact. In terms of what I haven't mentioned, which um, I think is important, one is the household structure of the data. So I typically use the individual level data and, and really neglect some of the impacts that are potentially important across the household. So that's both the role of the household in the impact of disability on labour market outcomes, but also how disability within the household can perhaps have spillover effects to other household members. A lot of the work I've done is really focused on when, when disabled individuals are in work, but actually there's a whole, um, I think, body of interesting questions around non-employment and, and job seeking and intentions to work and, and the other side of that. And I think we've probably talked about um, most of the future data collection the, this morning, but because disability is self-reported, it requires um, a survey question to collect it, unlike some measures which can be substituted by administrative da data. That means things like the quality of the survey, survey response rates are going to be critical. And um, the need to modernise and enhance data is clearly there, but at the same time I'm really aware of how sensitive the measurement of disability is and the problems created by discontinuities. A lot of the value in what um, the LFS shows is, is change over time and the impact of... Um, so in terms uh, of discontinuities, they need to be really carefully managed as we, we've talked about this morning. And then, again, to pick up on how you perhaps use, utilise, better utilise the LFS, where you can match data potentially in at least local levels or occupational industry levels. I know that there was discussion this morning of perhaps linking with administrative data on an individual level, which would clearly make it richer, but also don't be afraid to use the LFS as one of multiple sources. So um, certainly in papers I've used the LFS and, and WERS to look at kind of the strengths and limitations of, of both um, sources of data. Thank you.